Welcome, loyal blog readers, to our Friday series of podcasts, uh, the Class Action Weekly Wire. I'm Jerry Matman, a partner at Dwayne Morris, and joining me today is my associate, Ethan Feldman, and we're here to talk about products liability and mass torts. Welcome, Ethan. Great to be here. Thank you for having me, Jerry. I've read somewhere in various accounts that 2022 was uh, a phenomenal, incredible year for the class action space when it came to products liability and mass torts. How would you sum up what happened in the last 12 months? It's definitely been busy. Um, it always is. Last year, I mean, we saw a lot of settlements in the opioid arena. Um, they totaled around 50 billion, uh, that's with a B billion, um, due to a bunch of multi billion dollar settlements coming out of multi-district litigation. A lot of the lawsuits were brought by state and local governments against the manufacturers and distributors. Um, one of the main players in there was Purdue Pharma, um, the manufacturer of OxyContin. Um, that entity agreed to pay $12 billion in settlement. Uh, the end of May, May 30th, 2023, the Second Circuit approved a plan under the under which the Sackler family, the owners of Purdue Pharma, actually would give up ownership of the company and contribute $11.5 billion in cash over time to prevent, um, to distribute that to a, a fund to prevent and treat addiction. Um, of those funds, 750 million is slated to go to individual victims, and payouts are expected in the range of about 3,500 to $50,000. Um, the retailers were also involved. CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart agreed to settle their claims for about $14 billion um, with the state and local governments. Uh, other manufacturers, Teva and Allergen, reached settlements um, not to exceed $4.25 billion and $2.37 billion uh, paid out over 13 years. Um, some other distributors involved, McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amerisource Bergen, agreed to pay not more than $20 billion over 18 years. Uh, there were also 40 states um, that have their own specific agreements about apportionments between uh, state and local counties that have opted into the settlement. Um, they're all very different. Uh, the general theme is that it's determined by population. That's how the apportionment is going to be governed. There are absolutely eye-popping numbers to my way of thinking. The only analog in the recent uh, uh, American jurisprudence would be two decades ago when attorney generals settled big tobacco product liability and mass tort case, cases. So is there anything left or are we going to continue to see the tail of opioid litigation settlements in 2023? There's, that, there's I think there's going to be some more in 2023. There's a website, opioidsettlementtracker.com, um, which has uh, you know, reports that there's some settlement amounts between uh, U.S. governments, not federal, the state and local, like I talked about. Um, so I think we're going to start to see some of some of those come to fruition uh, in 2023. Really, really quite a story uh, and a headline for 2022 and 2023. For our listeners, could you articulate uh, in the class action space the difference between uh, product liability as opposed to mass torts and how they're different and how uh, they're, uh, they are related? Yeah, so they're definitely related, but they're also very different. Um, generally, if you take um, the, the sphere of product liability, you can divide that up into two categories. Um, there's the injury claims, and then there's the labeling claims. You can also think of the labeling claims as false advertising. Uh, the injury claims are best suited for the mass tort action, and the labeling claims um, more so lead to class actions. 
the the injury mass tort action usually can't satisfy the Rule 23 evidentiary requirements um, or the similar state procedural laws for that matter, um, just due to the individualized nature of uh, plaintiff specific circumstances that require uh, individual proof of the injury. Um, an example, you, you get a mass tort action that you know, plaintiffs claim they took a medication that causes all different kinds of cancers. Uh, those individual claims would require different types of proof that would um, likely prevent class certification. Um, you know, the, the, those, those types of claims are often, I would think, are defeated at the, at the class certification case, excuse me, class certification stage. Um, you know, they, they do lend themselves, however, to multi-district litigation and other coordinated proceedings that um, you can find in the states that involve the same product, same defendants, and the same set of operative facts. That's a, a great description of both the differences and the uh, relatedness of them. I, when I teach my law class at Northwestern, kind of the theme of a class action is the ability to put one person on the stand, they tell their story, and it transposes to everyone else. And when you're dealing with uh, mass torts and personal injury claims, everybody's damages tend to be different although those cases tend to be ripe for issue certification where liability issues might be dealt with on a class-wide basis, but injuries in uh, individual hearings. But you mentioned MDLs or multi-district litigation. Could you explain for our listeners the role that MDLs have in this space? So um, in 2022, the JPML, the Judicial Panel of Multi-District Litigation, um, reported there are 172 uh, pending MDLs across the country. Um, 21 of those had over a thousand pending actions, and another 24 of them had between 100 and 1,000 actions. The biggest was the 3M earplug litigation, which had over 250,000 claimants. And MDL proceedings make up roughly percent of all the federal dockets. So the MDL actions can often, like we spoke about, contain the uh, individualized product claims uh, distinct from the class claims. Uh, for example, um, in addition to the class claims, there's, there's current litigation over nicotine products, um, which has a personal injury aspect of it. Uh, which include allegations that exposure to nicotine can alter brain development. I know that the 3M earplug litigation got a lot of play in the media last year. Could you explain for our listeners what's going on in that MDL? That MDL called NRAY 3M Combat Arms Earplug Product Liability Litigation is currently pending in the United States District Court in the Northern District of Florida. Uh, there's been a bunch of bellwether trials there. You know, the, the, the verdicts were all over the place. You saw a plaintiff verdict for $77 million, and you also see defense verdict. Uh, that docket has, you know, over 3,500 filings, uh, was initially formed in 2019, and, you know, has even seen recent transfers into the MDL today. Um, you know, four years later. Uh, right now, those proceedings are stayed due to bankruptcy filed by a defendant that was acquired by 3M during the manufacturing of the earplugs that are at issue. Uh, plaintiffs, of course, want to lift the stay um, for certain claims that don't involve that defendant. Um, that master long form complaint actually contains 16 different causes of action. Uh, violations of state's consumer protection laws. Um, but but the main point are, the main point of the, the complaint is that defendants knew the earplugs were defective, made statements that misrepresented their effectiveness, and uh, you know, relying on those uh, misrepresentations, the plaintiffs used the earplugs and developed certain hearing disorders 
because of that. Um, there's also counts for negligence and strict liability under uh, design defect theories as well. Well, thanks for that cogent description. Um, what are other hot areas in the uh, products liability and mass tort arena? I gave a presentation at a class action conference last month in New York, a two-day conference, and day two was all about what was called the Camp Lejeune um, mass tort litigation in terms of uh, what's going on in the Eastern District of North Carolina. Would that be an area that our listeners should look to in 2023 for big developments in this space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you're referencing to PFOA litigation. Um, I'm going to do my best to pronounce it. Uh, Plurofluorooctonic acid. Um, I don't know if I said that right, but I did my best. But, you know, it's very well known as PFOA litigation. Um, these are used in a wide variety of products. Um, they're often called for forever chemicals because they take a long time to decompose. Um, there's types of lawsuits that, you know, defendants should have known that the PFOAs have the potential to cause bodily injury. And there's also been um, several lawsuits brought on behalf of states by the Attorney General, um, you know, for water contamination and things like that. Um, there's always going to be pharmaceutical litigation and medical device litigation, um, but the, the hotbed right now seems to be the PFOA litigation. These are great insights and analysis, Ethan. Thank you very much for joining us on the Friday Weekly Wire. And to our loyal blog listeners, thank you for tuning in uh, to our Friday podcast. Have a great day.